5.2 is on the mean value theorem and Rolle's theorem. The mean value theorem. And and rolls theorem. That's an ass. All right, before we do that, I would like to do a problem similar to the problem that we did um, or that would address some of the big ideas that we talked about last time in class. If you recall, last time we talked about um, we talked about the extreme value theorem. And when we talk about extrema, what are we referring to? Kyle, when we talk about extrema, what the heck is an extrema? Emma, what is an extrema? Huh? Yep, we're just talking about maxes and mins. So that's what we're going to do for this particular problem right now. So I want to find all relative extrema. What does relative extrema mean as opposed to absolute extrema? Catherine, do you remember what this relative, what relative extrema means? What's that? You don't remember? All right, so when we have a graph, we might have, this is a maximum defined by points around it, but we also have a maximum over here also defined by the points around it. If it's the highest point based upon the points around it, then it is a maximum point. Now, this point right here, that would be a relative, relative, relative um, maximum. And then this, it's not a relative, it is a global or absolute, absolute max, because it's the biggest maximum out of all of the points on this particular graph. Remember that from last time? Does that ring a bell, Catherine? Okay. So I want to find, let's just go back, I want to find the relative extrema, if it's going to let me go that far back, awesome. Cool for our equation of y equals 3x to the power of 4 minus 16x cubed plus 24x squared plus 48. That is my equation. Josh, what should I do first? Yeah, let's find the derivative. In fact, that's how we find uh, the derivative tells us our instantaneous slope at any value for x. And so if I want to know the slope, uh, I mean, if I want to find our maximum or minimums, then our slope is going to be zero. So let's find our derivative. So, um, Josh, can you help me out finding the derivative of this equation? Yeah. So for the first part, it would be 12x cubed. Okay. Minus 40x squared. Plus 40x. And what about this, the derivative of 48? 
Yeah, it's just zero. And if I'm trying to find a maximum, then this is going to be y prime is going to equal what? Zero. It's going to equal zero. So I'll just substitute that in here. Kyle, what do we do next? If Kyle, if I can solve for X, what does that tell me? If I solve for X and say X equals, I don't know, how about eight? What does that tell me? What's that? If, if, I, if I solve for this and I find that X equals eight, then what that would mean is that my slope is zero when X is eight. That's what it's going to tell me. But how do I solve for x? Emma, any ideas of how I'd solve for x? Can we factor? What, what do we have in all of these terms that could be factored out? Yeah. Here's a question for you really quick, Emma. Can I use the quadratic formula for this? The answer is no. Why? Why? Yeah, it's not, it's not quadratic. It's cubic. So we can't use the quadratic formula for this because it's cubic. So let's, let's, let's go ahead and see if we can factor something out of this. So you said 12, 12x. So if I factor out a 12x, Emma, what's left behind? Mm -hmm. Now I could use the quadratic formula for this, but it looks like it might be factorable. It might be, Kyle, is this factorable? Is this quadratic right here factorable? To what? All right, uh, plus two. So we're trying to think of, we're trying to think of an M and an N. When I multiply them together, I get this four, but when I add them together, I get this negative four. Can you think of, Kyle, can you think of an M and an N that will give me, when I multiply them, I get four, but when I add them, I get negative four? One times four. One times four, okay, one times four does give me four, but when I add them, doesn't that give me five? So one's a negative four. So one times negative four would give me a negative four, but I it should give me a four. That doesn't work. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, negative two actually does. Both of them being negative, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So I'm going to change this. Let's to, let's put that negative two and negative two because negative two times negative two gives me. 4 and negative 2 minus 2 gives me negative 4, which is exactly what I needed to find. All right, all of this equals, let's, all of this equals 0 because that's what our slope is. And so we need to think of an x value that gives me 0 over here. So 0 equals 0. It's a true equation. Catherine, can you think of an x value that will give me 0 over here? Sorry, what? Yeah. I agree with you, yeah. If x is two, then two minus two gives us zero. We get zero times anything gives us zero. We get zero equals zero. Is there another value for x that will give us zero? Besides two? Zero. Yeah, yeah, zero. In fact, if specifically, if specifically, if this x right here is zero, then 12 times zero is zero. Zero times anything is zero, and I have zero equals zero. So yeah, we have two values. Does that mean one of these is a maximum and the other one's a minimum? No. No, that doesn't tell me that. 
How do I find out which one's a max and a min? We have to use a sign diagram, yeah. We have to use a sign diagram. Di diagram. Okay, so we have two values. We have zero and we have two. How do we use the sign diagram to determine whether we have a maximum or a minimum? Okay, let's uh, let's do this in steps. So, what's a value for this interval? Try what? Right. Try try negative one. Okay. Try x equals negative one. If I plug negative one here, what is this? Is that positive or negative? Bless you. It's a negative. Okay. And if I plug in this negative one here, is that positive or negative? That's a negative. And if I plug in this negative one here. It's also a negative. So what is a negative times a negative times a negative? It's a negative. Which means what about the interval before zero? X equals zero. Yeah, we have a negative slope. Our slope goes down. We go down from there. All right. What about the interval from zero to two? All right. Yeah, we just find any value. It doesn't matter. One, one seems like an easy one. So let, let's try. Try x equals one. And if I plug one into here, is that positive or negative? Okay, so that's a positive. If I plug in one here, is that a positive or negative? It's a negative. And if I plug in one here, that's a negative. What is a positive times a negative times a negative? A positive. That means that the interval between zero and two does what? It's a positive slope, it goes up, good. What about over, what about this interval after two? Three. All right, yeah, let's try three. Try x equals three. And if I plug in three here, is that positive or negative? Positive, so positive. If I plug in the three over here, that's also positive, I agree with you. And if I plug the three over here into this, that's a positive as well. What is a positive times a positive times a positive? A positive, yep. So my question then is, what is happening when x equals zero? It's a minimum. Yeah, we have a we have a negative slope here until we get to that point, and then we have a positive slope. So that has to be a minimum. That has to be a minimum. So at when x when x equals zero, we have a minimum. X equals zero. I'll just write it out is a minimum. What about when x is two? Yeah, it's a stationary inflection point. Our graph is positive, positive, positive. It flattens out, so we have a zero slope, and then it becomes positive, positive. So we just have this one point where we have a zero slope. Is that a maximum or a minimum? It's neither, yeah, it's neither. It's not a maximum or a minimum. A maximum and a minimum are defined by the points around it. And the points around it, on one side we have, uh, we have points that are smaller than that point. And then on the right side, we have points that are larger. So that cannot be a maximum or a minimum. It's called a stationary inflection point. Is a stationary inflection point let me go back. Is a stationary inflection point an extrema? No. An extrema is just your maximum or your minimum. It's not either. So it is. So this is the only thing that I needed to find. I just needed to find the when that x equals zero is a minimum. What kind of minimum is this? Is this a relative or a uh, or an absolute? How do you, what did you say, a relative? How do we know? How can we determine it? Would we know because since there's a slope? All right, so on this, on the left-hand side of zero, we have a negative slope, okay? And then, and then a positive slope, and a positive slope. Is that relative? 
What is it? It's an absolute. Yep, it's an absolute. This is uh, this is absolute. Absolute. Yeah, the graph doesn't go any further down than that. So this is an absolute minimum. Should we graph it? Let's graph it and see what it looks like. What kind of graph do we start with? What is this? What function family does this belong to? It's quartic. It's quartic. If our degree is even, what does that say about end behaviors? This is a secondary math three idea. If our degree is even, what does it say about end behaviors? They're, they're the same, right? They're either both positive, they either shoot off to infinity on both sides or they shoot off to negative infinity on both sides. Because our leading term is positive, it means that they're going to shoot off to positive infinity to both sides. So let's go ahead and graph this. We'll go to Desmos. Then we'll type in our equation. We have y equals 3x power 4 minus 16x cubed plus 24x squared plus 48. And this is, where are we? Oh, there we are. So is it a, was this an absolute minimum? Yeah. We don't get any smaller than that to that point. And then we can see when x equals, what, uh, 2, we see that we have that inflection point, right? Uh, I can't quite reach it, it's too small. Do you guys see the inflection point? What defines it as an inflection point? So inflection, an inflection point is defined by concavity. What does it say about, if it's an inflection point, what does it say about concavity? Yeah, the concavity changes. We can see that we went from concave on the left-hand side, it's concave down to concave up. It changes at that particular point right here when X is two, the concavity of the graph changes from, um, con uh, from concave down to concave up. Okay, that's move on. So I want to talk about what is called the first derivative test. And I'm going to use a word monotonic. And I, that, I know that sounds sort of like a weird word, but monotonic literally means where the graph has a positive or a negative slope. It's really what we're finding with our sign diagram. It's called uh, when a graph is monotonic, uh, the monotonic properties where the graph is exclusively, uh, where it's exclusively negative or when it's exclusively positive. So here is the definition of the first derivative test. And the first derivative test examines the functions monotonic monotonic properties examines a graph or a functions monotonic monotonic properties Um, and it, monotonic just means where the graph is increasing or decreasing. What's the main idea today?
Yeah, so we're going to talk about the mean value theorem. And I really think it's helpful um, to for me to explain to you just in the simplest of words what the mean value theorem is, and then I'll define it more rigorously. So here's the idea of the mean value theorem. So this is the mean. Let me capitalize this. The mean value theorem. So when I have the mean value theorem, if I have some curve that is continuous and differentiable, then it guarantees that at least one point, the derivative or the instantaneous rate of change is going to be equal to the average rate of change. Okay, one more time. If I have a graph that is continuous and differentiable from A to B, then it guarantees that for we have some average rate of change, right? The average rate of change would be this line right here. It guarantees that there's some instantaneous rate of change in here that would be equal to the average rate of change. In fact, I can see two points that are probably equal to the average rate of change, maybe here. And, oops, I didn't quite draw a tangent line. Let me try that again. Right here and right here. Do you guys buy that? In this case, we have two. Okay, one more time. If I have a curve from A to B that is continuous, then there's some point on the graph where the instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change from A to B. Does it make logical sense? Okay. So we're going to write this out. If we have our function of f of x and it is continuous, at every point, of the closed interval, interval, the closed interval, A to B, and differentiable, at every point, then, there is at least one point of C in the interval from A to B where F prime of C is equal to the average rate of change for the interval. That's average. That's really what I wrote here is really just my y sub at two minus y sub at one over x sub at two minus x sub at one. That is the same thing. Josh, can you simplify to me what the mean value theorem is? That's exactly correct. Yep. Uh, it sometimes gets wordy when I write out a theorem, especially when we're trying to be really rigorous with our definition. It sometimes gets so wordy in here that it feels like maybe some meaning has been lost. But really what, what we're really talking about is if, we're, if we're, we're talking about an interval that is continuous from, let's do another one, an interval that is continuous from A to 
B, that guarantees that there's some point in there that has an instantaneous rate of change equal to the average rate of change. Yep. Okay, let's do an example. Given f of x is equal to x squared on the interval from zero to two, I want to find a value for C such that F prime of C is equal to F of B minus F of A all over B minus A. Isn't this the mean value theorem? This is an, a past IB problem. This is the wording from a past AP calculus problem. Do you see when you look at this that they're literally talking about the mean value theorem? Okay. So how would we do it? How would we find this value C such that we have an instantaneous rate of change at that point that is equal to the average rate of change? Emma, do you have any ideas? Okay. We're trying to find this. This problem is literally the mean value theorem. We're trying to find for the, the this value from A to B. It looks like it's quadratic, right? So I'll draw this like a quadratic. So from A to B, that we want to find the instantaneous, that point C, where the instantaneous rate of change at that point is equal to the average rate of change. How do I do that? Josh? Well, since you know, you can like sort of plug in what's the average. Okay, so we're going to find the average rate of change. What are these? Are those my X's or my Y's? Those are my X's. How do I find my Y's? Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm literally using this for my slope. I'm figuring out, this is for my average rate of change. My Y subs at two minus Y subs at one over X subs at two minus X subs at one. We know what our X's are, it's zero, and two, so we'll just write this out as zero minus two. And Josh, one more time, how do I find my corresponding y values for those x values? You just plug it into the x yeah, let's plug it in and then it'll tell me my corresponding y value. So for zero, if I plug in zero, what's my, if I plug in zero for x, what is my corresponding y value? It's zero, zero squared is zero. We'll do the same thing with the next one. So minus, we'll take this two and plug it in. What do we get when we plug in two? What is our corresponding Y value? It's four, so it's four. So my average rate of change is what? Louder? It's two. I get negative four over negative two, which is just two. My average rate of change is two. Now I'm trying to find a C value with an instantaneous rate of change that is equal to two. How do I do that? I know what my average rate of change is, it's two. How do I find some C value that is that has the instantaneous rate of change of two? Yes, sir, Josh. Could you 
square. Yeah. Let's take the derivative of this, which would be what? F prime of X is what? 2X. 2X, okay. And then for the X prime of X plus two. Yeah, so let's take this. That's my average, that's my, that's, I'm trying to find where I have an instantaneous rate of change of two. So that is my F prime of X. So I'm gonna plug that in. That gives me, I'll change color, so let's do uh, green. So I have two equals two X, and then what? Yeah, X equals one. So I divide by two, both sides divide by two. That gives me X equals one. My C value, where I have an instantaneous rate of change that is equal to the average rate of change is when X equals one for this interval, for this interval, right? So let's, let's try this. Let's go to, let's go to, let's go to Desmos. I thought I opened Desmos, but I guess I didn't, there it is. And so we have our function F of X and that equals X squared. Where is it? Way down here somewhere. Way down here. There. I did not, did not realize I was so far. Okay. There we go. And then we have two points that we found. We have uh, point zero, zero, oops, comma, zero. And one, no, that was two, two, four. So that's those two points right here. And we know that the slope is two. So I have um, about y, y minus four equals, our slope is two, two, and x minus two. Isn't that our point slope form? Isn't that the point slope form? And I want to know whether that is going to be, is, is, is that slope here of two, is it two? Is that two? Two up, two, two up, one over, two up, one over, yeah. It looks like it is. So it's two up, one over, two up, one over. Is that equal to the slope that we get at one, one? What do you think? Does it look like that might be? I, mean, I guess we could find the rest. How, how would we find the equation for this tangent line? How do we find the equation for this tangent line? How do I find the equation for this tangent line? We know the slope is two, right? Okay, so we have y equals two x. That's the same line. We need to find our y to set, we need to find our b value. How do we find a b value? How do we find the B value? Do we know what X and Y are so that we can find B? Do we know what X and Y are? Yeah. That's one one, yeah. It, that we know that there's some tangent line that, that goes through this point. So we know what, so uh, at that point, that point is one one. So I plug one, one into this and I get what, what's my B? Negative one. Negative one, yeah. So I get two and one and then I subtract the two, give me neg negative one. So that gives me negative one. Do they look parallel? Do those lines look parallel? Is that instantaneous rate of change right here? Does it look parallel to our average rate of change? 
Yeah, it looks parallel to me too. It looks like we did, we, we, looks like we nailed it. Looks like we nailed it. Okay, let's move on to another one. Here's our next example. I have f of x equals the absolute, that's not absolute value, the square root of one minus x squared. And I have some a point that is equal to negative one comma f of negative one. Some b point that is equal to one comma f of one. And I want to find a tangent line that is parallel to this line segment from A to B. Does this say the mean value theorem? Is it the same thing? So the mean value theorem says that there is some instantaneous rate of change that is equal to the average rate of change for the interval if it's continuous and differentiable. Where does it say in this question, where does it say anything about average rate of change? Yeah, yeah, this line segment right here, that is the average rate of change from A to B. And if it's parallel, it means it's gonna be this, it's the, um, the slope is going to be the same as, where does it say anything about an instantaneous rate of change? Yeah, I need to find the tangent line. And if this time they want us to calculate the tangent line. They want us to actually calculate that Y equals MX plus B. Well, where do we start? Catherine, where do I start? Um, would you first take the of the oh, Sure. So in fact, I think it might be helpful if we rewrote this using no calculus whatsoever. If I rewrote this as the quantity of one minus X squared all to the power of one half. Catherine, is that helpful? Yeah. Okay, so now, how do I find the derivative of this? You almost got it. Did we just didn't we just calculate the the derivative of the outer function? Doesn't this look like the chain rule? What we just took the derivative of is u to the power of one half. Yeah, times negative two x. Yeah. Yep. Okay, now what? Josh? Okay. Cause, yeah, because we don't know what needs to go in here, right? We don't know what the average rate of change is. So we, we really need to find that. So let's go ahead and find, uh, find the slope. Find the average rate of change. How do I do that? So we know your x values are. Okay, we know we, our x values, like you said, are negative one and one. So that means if our average rate of change is the y subs at two minus y subs at one over x subs at two minus x subs at one, these are my x values. So I'm gonna plug those into the denominator. So that gives me um, negative one minus one, is that, is that okay? Yeah. How do I find the y values? Well, 
we plug what into f of x? Yeah, if I want to find the corresponding y value for negative one, I plug that right into here. So we have one minus, and then in parentheses, if I have negative one squared, what's negative one in parentheses squared? One, and then, it, it, then one minus one is zero, and the square root of zero is zero. So our corresponding y value for negative one is zero. Now I need to find the corresponding y value for one. Let's plug the one in, what do we get? It's zero again, it's zero again. So the average rate of change is what? It's zero, yeah, it's zero. What do I do with this average rate of change? Yeah, we're trying to find where we have an instantaneous rate of change that is equal to the average rate of change. So we plug that in for f prime of x. So that becomes zero. So I have zero equals this one half times one minus x squared to the power of negative one half times two x. How would I solve for that mess? I'm gonna rewrite this. I'm gonna rewrite this and see if it'll give us some better guidance. I'm gonna rewrite this to see if it gives us better guidance. Now, if I have a negative exponent, what does that mean if I wanted to simplify that? It's just Move it to the denominator. So in my denominator I have, uh, to the power of one half is really the square root, right? The square root of one minus x squared. And then, What's in the numerator? We have this negative two X, but we also have this two down here. Yeah, the twos cancel out, leaving me with just negative X in the numerator. How would we solve for this? What if I multiply by the denominator? I had a student a couple of years ago that said, Mr. Hall, that's wishing your problems away. What happens, if I multiply by the square root of one minus X squared, what happens to the left-hand side? It's just zero, yeah. What happens to the right-hand side? Yeah, this divided by this, it's the same. Anytime you have the same in the numerator as the denominator, then that equals one. So I have one of these negative x's, which is what? It's zero, it's zero, it's zero. So we have, we're finding that when x is zero, we have an f prime of x of zero. We have our instantaneous rate of change of zero. When X is zero, we have our instantaneous rate of change of zero. Did we answer the question? Doesn't it want us to find a tangent line? We didn't find a tangent line. How do we find a tangent line? How do I find a tangent line? I know that X is zero. How do I find, so, we, so a tangent line is linear, right? Tangent line is linear, so we're going to use our Y equals MX plus B. Do we know what M is? What is it? It's zero, yeah, we just found it, it's zero. We know M is zero, and if I wanna find B, I need to know my X and Y's. Do we know an X and Y? Our x, our x is zero. What's our y? How do we find a y? How 
how do I find a y? If I know that x is zero, how do I find a y? In, into where? Into the original equation. We plug x into the original equation. So that gives me the square root of one minus x squared. And now x is zero. So one minus zero squared. Yeah, it gives me the square root of one, which is just one. So we have, that's just one. So if all of this goes away, then we're just left with y or b equals one. And so with our equation, if we have y equals zero x plus one, and zero x is just zero, just zero, so that gives me y equals one. Does that look right to you? Yeah. Is that parallel? Is that parallel to our average rate of change? Let's see. Let's see. So let's get rid of all of this. And I have f of x equals the square root of one minus x squared. Oh, it's a half circle. And we found that the average rate of change from, the, from these two, for these two points right here and here, I'll just mark those down as negative one comma zero and one comma zero. We found, let's just draw a line. So y equals zero. The average rate of change from both, from this point to this point is equal to the average rate of, or the instantaneous rate of change at, um, at this point here, zero, one. Do you buy it? Do you buy it or not? Does it look like they're equal? Yeah, I agree with you. They look like they're equal. And actually, I think this is a great segue to what is called um, Rolle's theorem. Copy that and do. That's our equation that represents all that work that we did down there. Zoom in. So what the heck is Rolle's theorem? That was the other part that we have to discuss in the short amount of time that we have left over. So I'm going to, here's Rolle's theorem. I'm gonna explain it and then I'm, I'm going to explain it in the simplest of words and then I will define it rigorously. The idea is if I have some point of A to some other point of B and the Y values are the same, then that guarantees that I have, if it's continuous and differentiable, that guarantees that I have um, a maximum or a minimum. It guarantees that I have um, some point where our C value equals zero. I guess it doesn't guarantee a maximum or a minimum, but it does guarantee that there's some point where my instantaneous rate of change is zero. One more time. The idea of Rolle's theorem says that if I have an A and a B value, and the Y values are the same for our A and B, that guarantees that there's some point in there with an instantaneous rate of change of zero. Does that make logical sense? That, that happens here. Our Y values are the same for both of those points. So here we go, our rigorous definition. Let F be a function that satisfies
the following. Number one, F is continuous. On the closed interval, A to B. Number two, F is differentiable. On the closed, on the open interval. A to B. And number three, f of a equals f of b. This literally means y equals y. This literally means y equals y. f of a is our y value when x equals a, and f of b is our y value when b equals zero, or x equals b, I should say, when x equals b. So these are literally our y values, when y equals y. It's basically what I set up here. If I, if I have some continuous, um, continuous interval from A to B where our Y values are the same and it's, in, it's differentiable for the full interval, except for endpoints, endpoints can't be differentiable, then it guarantees that there's some instantaneous rate of change that's equal to zero. So then, that's sloppy. Then, it's still sloppy. There is a number C in A, the interval uh, from A to B, such that F prime of C equals zero. That is Rawls theorem. Is it logical? Josh, can you explain it? Can you explain this in your own words? <laughs> 